Y'all don't know a damn thing about Jamarcus Russell. Written by Jamarcus Russell. Narrated by MC's voice. First time I drank some codeine, I was about 14 years old. It was just a normal day at the park. In Mobile, Alabama, football is jumping. You go to the park by my grandma's house and there's always some kids playing, some older guys shooting dice or whatever, just sitting around with the cooler. Normally, they were always drinking beers. But more and more, I started seeing all these grown men drinking sodas. I'm not thinking anything of it. I know everybody. I'm chilling. Jamarcus, get you something from the cooler. So I go over and grab me a drink. But shit, I must have grabbed some drink instead. No, ain't no muster. I had to grab some drink. Because a couple minutes later, this pineapple orange fago got me faded. And then my boy, I'm not gonna say his name, he realizes what's going on and he starts panicking. He's like, yo, don't tell nobody in your family about this. You're gonna be straight, but you better go lie down for a minute. He knew my mama would have tore his ass up if she found out. My uncles, my daddy, everybody would have been looking for him. Man, I never even smoked weed growing up because I was so scared of coming back home to a house full of my aunts and uncles smelling some loud on me. They'd have taken turns whipping my ass. The first time I smoked weed when I was released by the Raiders, my family had me locked in, so my boy was stressing. He actually gave me the keys to the hotel where he was staying because he knew in about 20 minutes that drink was gonna have my ass sleep. He was more scared of my mama than my daddy. I know you're not gonna say nothing to Zena, right? She's crazy. Ha 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 for real. My head hit that pillow and boy, I was out. That was my first time drinking syrup. Wasn't the last time. A lot of y'all people up north, even black folks at that time, they didn't really understand it. It was just different down here. Some syrup for us, that's like you might drink some wine or something. I'm not glorifying it, but back then, that was the cheapest way for them boys to sip on something. You grow up in poverty, you're gonna figure out a way to cope with it, feel me? Funny thing is, I never liked painkillers. In college and the NFL, they were handing that shit out like Skittles, but I didn't like the way they made me feel. So I handled it my way. When I was at LSU and I dislocated my shoulder against Georgia in the SEC championship game, I still had to go to my classes. I actually had shredded ligaments in my throwing hand too, so I'm sitting in them hard ass school chairs and I can't even concentrate. I was in so much pain that one morning I just said fuck it and took some drink with me to class had my little styrofoam cup and everything. Looked just like a soda from the cafeteria. I don't know how the hell the teacher even found out, but somebody in class snitched on me. You know what's crazy to me? If I had three or four pills in my pocket, nobody would have batted an eye. I mean, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. It ain't for fun, you feel me? I'm in pain, and that's just how I knew to deal with it. I was honest with the coaches about what was going on and they knew me as a person, so they handled it quietly. I did my punishment, which was not attending the bowl game, and we kept it moving. I ain't no saint, but come on, man. They shoot your ass up with the strongest painkillers on earth just to get you out on the field. But you're drinking some cough syrup and now you're a criminal? Do you even know the kind of pain you're in week to week playing football? I played a whole season in the NFL with broken bones in my ankle. We all got ways to cope. Some taking pills, some sipping syrup, some drinking heavy, some smoking weed. Shit, some even snorting cocaine. One way or another, you're gonna numb the pain. But as long as you getting your fix from the team, it's good, right? It's all good. I'm just being honest. And they don't like you being honest. Listen, I know you heard all the rumors about me. 
What'd they say? Jamarcus Russell was a bust because he was drinking syrup. He was on some thug shit. He didn't love the game. Man, my story is so much deeper than some drink. It's so much deeper than the Raiders or the NFL or football. I've endured 10 plus years of people slandering my name and I've never said a word. It's my turn to speak on it. If you want to judge me, then judge me. But at least know where I come from first. I got some stories that'll make your head spin. I'm going to give Hollywood the script for the realest movie of all time. Let's start with the supporting cast. You come down to Mobile and you're going to meet some of the greatest characters on earth. Characters they ain't never put on a screen. My daddy. Legendary Hooper. Name rang out in every neighborhood. They talked about him like he was Jordan before Jordan. Man, your daddy used to break backboards in the 80s. He was going to win the game or he was going to win the fight after. I never believed it. Old heads bullshitting like always. Then one day we were in Lenox Mall in Atlanta. And everybody know those big escalators they have there. Me and my daddy are going up. And this tall dude coming down. I see the dude do a double take at my daddy. He's pointing this shit like he's a fan. And he says, Bobby Lloyd. My daddy just looks at him and nods. Dude says, God damn, Bobby Lloyd. Been a long time, brother. It was Dominique Wilkins. My daddy just turns to me and says, See, I told y'all, I've been busting ass for a long time. Real shit on everything. That's my daddy. Uncle Ray Ray. Radio DJ and mobile. Like a second father to me, for real. He was on the morning show and he used to start every show, 6 o'clock in the morning. Wake up, it's Ray Ray. Everybody in mobile knows that line, man. I knew people who got locked up who said that when the female guards came around to do a cell check, all the prisoners would be yelling out, Wake up, it's Ray Ray. Ray was a comedian. He was on Comic View back in the day. I remember he used to always come up to the little kids in the family if they had something good to eat and he'd say, You forgot to feed the dog, boy. But he the dog, he be cocking his head at you like a puppy, looking at your mac and cheese, sniffing. It was so damn funny. But when you were done feeding the dog, ain't no food left on your plate. That's Ray Ray. Uncle Marcus, my namesake. More like a big brother to me, honestly. He was the guy who got me into football at four years old. I wasn't even supposed to be able to play yet. But one day he had his homeboy Wesley distract my mama while he went into her purse and snatched my birth certificate so he could sign the waiver for me to play. They were doing some Ocean's Eleven type shit. My mama was always working, so she didn't even know I was playing football for a minute. Sorry, mama. My mama. My mama's side of the family got doctors, professors, PhDs. I got nieces getting 28 on the ACT in the eighth grade. My uncle Al got degrees on degrees. My mama's smart as hell too, but when she got pregnant with me at age 20, her whole life changed. Shit, I almost wasn't here to tell you this story. My mama was sitting in the waiting room at the abortion clinic with the weight of the world on her shoulders agonizing over the thought of raising a child in the middle of nothing but poverty. Five minutes before the doctor came out to see her, she ran out the door. When I was born, she was going to community college and she used to carry me to class with her. Books in one hand, car seat in the other. Shout out to Miss Teresa and Miss Betty for watching me while she was in class. My mom was a hardworking, amazing woman, but if I ever acted up around her, I'm getting my ass tore up. You think I'm being funny? I'll never forget. I was nine years old playing against House of Hope. I think they were a sorry ass church team or something. We blasted they ass. At the end of the game, as I'm walking off the field, I took my helmet off and the other team's coach smacked the back of my head like, good job. Back then, I always went bald headed like my daddy and I felt like this man slapped me a little bit too hard, you feel me? 
it went crack on the back of my head. Man, I reached up nine years old and slapped the shit out of this man. He was shocked. I start walking off the field talking to my boys or whatever and then, like I don't know how it feels when a shark attacks you but, boop, right in my side. I'm on the ground and my mama is tearing my ass up, boy. She stripped me by my football pants. Pull them pants down. You think you can act up? She's whooping my ass in front of everybody, man. My daddy comes running. Hey, Zena, you saw what the coach did to him? What was he supposed to do? My mama jumps up and starts going at my daddy now. Excuse me, excuse me. You got something to say? Well, fuck you too then. There was an old man standing there with a cane. And my mama snatched the cane and started going at my daddy with it. Say something. I'm fixing to get your ass too. Yo, I'm serious on everything. That's my mama. And where do you think she got it from? My grandma. Church lady for real. Seventh day of Venice. Grandma, I'm sorry for all the cussing, but I got to be real with these folks. My grandma couldn't even watch my football games because she was so worried about me. She used to call my uncles. How's Jamarcus doing? They losing? Is he getting hit? She used to drop to her knees and just pray for me. Call my uncle back. How they doing now? They winning? All right. I'll get up off the floor in a minute. Man, I was at LSU when I got hurt in the SEC championship game. My grandma was at a wake at the time, and she heard about it from somebody. She was so upset, she had to go straight home and have a prayer session. A week later, the whole team was signing autographs somewhere, and my grandma shows up, and she just marching straight up to all my offensive linemen talking about, you let my baby get hurt. She comes up to my left guard, Terrell McGill. Boy, why you let Jamarcus get hit? He's like, Grandma, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. She's shaking her head on some church lady shit, all disappointed in him, like, y'all need to keep my boy safe. <laughs> Yo, for real, that's Grandma. Y'all got the characters. We straight now? We gonna make this movie? Action. I'm 13 years old. My Aunt Terry gets a call from the football coach. Hey. You need to get Jamarcus's ass in the weight room immediately. She said, why? He said, we need him to play quarterback. She said, what? He a freshman. Aunt Terry always used to call me little boy. Even now, I'm 36 years old. And she's still saying, what you doing, little boy? So she was thinking the coach had lost his damn mind. See, so many guys had got locked up for street shit the summer before my freshman year. They needed me to play varsity. Quarterback won. My grandma was screaming when they told her the news. He too little. He's just a baby. Oh, Lord. I'm so skinny. I get into the weight room and I can't even lift a plate, bro. I'm supposed to be playing against grown-ass men. This ain't no Friday night lights. It's different down here. In mobile, these boys might be sipping on some Thunderbird before the game type of dudes that might drink a pint of gin, then go out and make 30 tackles for real. My one teammate used to hit guys so hard, he'd have a lump coming out of his own head like a cartoon character, like goddamn Looney Tune or something. Ask Cadillac Williams, he'll tell you. That's who I'm practicing against. And guess who my first game was against? Blunt High. See, you don't even understand if you're not from down here. These are some Pritchard boys. We won the state championship three years straight. They're grown men for real. You think I'm being funny? Man, they ended up getting their whole season suspended for playing overage players. I'm out there, skinny ass kid, running for my damn life against guys who are supposed to be in college. My grandma calling my uncles after every game on her knees. He okay? Is he breathing? I was with the wolves, bro, but for some reason, whenever I had that football in my hand, I can't explain it. 
It was magic. And shit, I didn't even know I was a black quarterback. The only white people I saw growing up was a couple of teachers. I was just a quarterback, man. All I know is, whenever I have that football in my hands, I'm gonna throw that motherfucker till the thread comes off that bitch. All of a sudden, my name starts ringing out. I was somebody, at least in the neighborhood. After my freshman year, I remember grandma sitting me down in the den and saying, you need to be careful, Jamarcus, because the way I see it, you're gonna be as big as Michael Jackson. They're gonna be following you everywhere. I had my little Kobe Bryant afro back then, and I remember people around mobile starting to show up to games rocking their afro wigs for me. Shout out to Fence Click. We had that stadium packed out every weekend. I had dope boys coming up to me, making sure I was straight. I never was in the streets because I never had to be. I got uncles in every neighborhood who aren't even my blood, you feel me? By 10th grade, I was getting so many letters, man. LSU, Florida State, Florida, Alabama, USC, everybody. I had a scholarship waiting from every college there was, for real. And the cool part about it was that I had Bobby Bowden, Nick Saban, all these big time coaches coming down to mobile. They're riding around the neighborhood, hitting the corners, spending time in my grandma's house. I'm sitting there in class, 10th grade, just pinching myself like, damn. Bobby Bowden really knows my grandma. My mama used to work at Spencer's Gifts in the mall, and now I got these famous motherfuckers coming down here and calling her name. Oh, hell yeah. That was the illest shit ever. This is how fast life came at me when I was at LSU. My red shirt junior season, I'm chilling with my boy Dwayne Bo, Debo. We're about to play Notre Dame in the Sugar Bowl, and I'm killing it. Debo was on the phone with somebody, and I didn't know who it was. I found out later it was a runner for an agent. Debo's talking to him, and he says, Yo, this guy wants to holler at you. He hands me the phone, and the guy says, So, what are you trying to do next year? I said, The hell you talking about? I got school. What? You not leaving? You tripping. I got school. Man, listen, you need to call your family right now and give them my number. You're ranked grade A. What that mean? You're the number one or number two quarterback in the nation right now. Word? Yeah, get your uncle or your mama to holler at me. Man, I wasn't even thinking about the NFL at that point. So I got my uncle Ray to check into it. And he said it was the truth. I said, so what that mean? He said, about 60, 70 million dollars. Man, after we beat the brakes off Notre Dame, I was getting interviewed on the field and all the fans were chanting, one more year, one more year. It really put it in perspective like, shit, this is real. I called my mama up. Mama, they're saying I'm about to make a whole lot of money if I leave school. She said, well, what do you think? I said, motherfuck school, mom. <laughs> Yo, listen, man. You can take whatever you want from my story, good and bad, but I was a young black kid from Mobile, and they're talking about millions? I had a chance to change my family's life by playing the game I love, and I really did that shit. I'll never forget when I declared for the draft, my uncle got on the radio and quit his job live on 92.9 WBLX. Wake up, it's Ray Ray. 20 years on the radio and he just up and quit. It's been a pleasure everybody, but my nephew about to go to the league. God bless, I'm out. <laughs> my mama was so mad when she heard that. He had a party set up and everything. She called him up. What you talking about? You think you're gonna be his business manager? We ain't talk about this. But he was always my right hand for everything. He was the one who took me out of the neighborhood. That was my road dog, for real. He drove me all the way from Mobile to Los Angeles when I was 14 just for a damn football camp. Without somebody like that behind you, you can't really make it out, no matter how good you are. So if I was going to the league, Uncle Ray was coming with me, Uncle Marcus too. 
I mean, they're talking number one or two in the goddamn nation. It was everything I dreamed about, man. So what the hell happened then? All right, all right. Damn, you about to make a nigga cry with this part. It was the day after my pro day. We were all in New Orleans, my whole family. I was there to get the Manning Award. Night before, we're planning to go out and chill. My Uncle Marcus had been having some problems with alcohol, but we thought he had everything under control. At the award ceremony, I asked him if he was coming out with us. He said, nah, you go ahead. I'm going to stay here with the wife. So we all go out to celebrate. Whoop de whoop. Next morning, I hear somebody beating on my door. Womp, womp, womp. It's my mama. I open the door and she's standing there in the bra and jeans. So I knew something was wrong. I said, what's going on? She said, it's Marcus. He not breathing. He not breathing. I run into his room and he just slumped on the floor. He looked like he was gone for real. Mama crying, grandma crying, aunties crying. All of a sudden, my uncle starts to move. He stands up and he's just staring into the distance. His hands are trembling like he's trying to cast a spell on somebody. Then he just starts screaming out. I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We found out later he was having some kind of breakdown. It's like he didn't even recognize us. He's screaming, you won't take me, Satan. You ain't gonna get me like that. Oh no. We hear the police sirens outside the hotel and now I'm thinking to myself, New Orleans police about to bust into a room full of black folks with my uncle losing his goddamn mind. Please God, don't let them kill nobody in this hotel room today. Please protect this family. The police came in, and it was just a wild scene. My uncle didn't want anybody to touch him. They were trying to get him to go sign a paper so that they could put him on a gurney to go to the hospital, and he was screaming, I'm not going to sign my life over to you, Satan. You won't take me, Satan. You ain't going to get me like that. Oh, no. Somehow they got him on the gurney, and when he arrived at the hospital, he wouldn't calm down. Then it was like a miracle happened. This older black lady nurse touched his arm real gently and it was like he just melted. I didn't know why, but he trusted her. She gave him a shot and then he settled down. But I'll never forget, they still had him handcuffed to the table and his hand was in those cuffs, just shaking and shaking. That image is burned into my brain. After that, he was a shell of himself for a long time. He couldn't even come to the draft with us. Everybody was there except for him. I mean, this was the man who used to take me to the park to play football. This was my big brother. I carried that hurt with me for a long time. Even my draft night wasn't a happy moment, to be honest. If you look at pictures from that night, I wasn't cheesing. I don't think I smiled one time, not even when the commissioner called my name. In retrospect, I understand why people were confused. They didn't know what was going on with me. That was one of my problems in the NFL. I could never put on the act. I could never fake it. My first two seasons in Oakland, I was still learning how to be professional. But then right before the 2009 season, the wheels really came off. It's one thing to lose football games. It's another thing to lose your people. I lost two of my uncles in a span of three months. April 2009, my Uncle Ray died. July 2009, my Uncle Mike died. Heart failure, heart attack, out of the blue. My Uncle Marcus was still going through his thing, so he couldn't even go to the funerals. Other than my daddy, these were the men who'd had my back my whole life. Uncle Ray was with me every step of the way. This man had the genius idea to put a little Nike pin on my suit when I declared for the draft, even though I wasn't signed with anybody yet. Nike called us up a couple of weeks later, talking about a shoe deal. He was my right hand from day one, gone. My uncle Mike worked at the Mead Paper Company and he always used to come home with a bag full of school supplies for me. A whole bunch of those black composite notebooks he was always on the grill at the cookout. Coolest dude in the world. 
gone. Uncle Marcus, at least as I knew him, gone. My head was hurting so damn bad, bro. Felt like everybody was just leaving me. I remember that whole summer was just a blur. We buried Mike on July 25th, and I was supposed to be at a training camp three days later. I love football with all the life I ever breathed. But at that point, I was just lost. I'm not trying to be out there running no goddamn 40s. I'm not trying to lift no weights. I'm trying to pour up and forget everything. I'm not going to lie to you. I was staying up late, drinking, getting tattoos and shit. I didn't have any time to grieve. I remember getting to training camp and warming up out in the field before practice and just crying and crying. Tears just falling out my face like, God damn, man, in front of everybody. Anybody come to check on me? Anybody ask me if I was okay? In the league, if you're hurting, the only thing they got for you is pills. I had been prescribed Ambien for my sleep apnea, and remember I took two of them bitches, and I still couldn't sleep. Mine was racing, heart hurting. I called up the coach at like four o'clock in the morning like, coach, I know we got practice tomorrow, but I ain't even slept yet. Before you know it, it's 6.30 a.m. and I'm suited up. I'll never forget, after practice, I went to talk to the team doctor and as we're discussing everything, I'm falling asleep mid-cry. Tears falling out my eyes and I'm dozing off, for real. But do you think anybody really cares? All they care about is winning and I wasn't winning. None of those coaches wanted me in the first place. Only Al Davis wanted me, that's on record. Those coaches didn't give a damn about me, not as a player and damn sure not as a person. That whole 2009 season was a mess. Finally, it got to a breaking point. We're sitting in the QB room one day, going over film after a loss, and my quarterback coach starts up. He's motherfucking me, calling me a son of a bitch and whatnot. Look at this, motherfucker! Now let's get this straight. I've been cussed out before. I got cussed out by Jimbo Fisher at LSU a thousand times, and I'd still run through a wall for that man, because Jimbo really took his time and coached me. I got to really get to know him as a man. In the NFL, it's not like that. I never even had this coach's phone number. Outside the facility, we didn't speak. There was no relationship. So I'm sitting there with two white quarterbacks and a white coach, and I know what I'm hearing. You're not talking to me like I'm your quarterback. You're not talking to me like I'm a human being. Son of a bitch, motherfucker. I can tell when somebody is saying it with that little extra. There's motherfucking somebody and there's motherfucking somebody. You feel me? That motherfucker sounding like a different word to me. I said, excuse me, sir. I'm not trying to be funny or anything, but watch how you're talking to me. My mom and dad don't even talk to me like that. I never lost this much in my life. I'm just as mad as anybody. Either you can talk to me with respect, like I know a player and a coach should, or we can sit here and bitch and motherfuck each other all day. It doesn't make a difference to me. He didn't say shit. He starts playing the film again, and now he got a little smirk on his face, and he's talking like, all right, J-Rock, I like your footwork here, J-Rock. I'm sitting there for five or ten minutes not saying a word. You could have heard a pin drop in there. Then, I don't know why, but I couldn't take it anymore. Everybody got a breaking point. I stood straight up and boom! I hit that goddamn table like Tyson or some shit, like a bomb went off. I pointed at him and I said, now, bitch, that's how you talk to me from now on. I haven't started a football game since. After that, they sent their people for me. You know how it works. They start leaking all kinds of stories. The media was talking crazy about me every day and it took a toll on my family. I had Stephen A. Smith calling me a fat slob on national television, saying I don't deserve a second chance. I still feel some type of way about that shit. But the worst was TNT. 
I took my father to an NBA game and when the cameras cut to us sitting courtside, the commentators were saying the wildest shit I've ever heard in my life. Jamarcus Russell, God, look at those necklaces. If he spent as much time in the film room as he did in the jewelry store, he'd be a much better quarterback. National television, bro. My grandma hearing that. When you're down, it's like everybody wants to pile on. Honestly, it just got to the point where I felt alone in the world. Like every time I went out in the field, I was by myself. Me versus everybody. The whole stadium. The whole world. Even me telling my story now, I almost didn't do it because I kept asking myself, why the hell would anybody want to hear from me? You know what's so crazy? When the Raiders released me, Al Davis didn't even look me in the eye one time. He talked straight at my agent. At that point, it was almost like a relief. I was just lost. I never really grieved the deaths in my family and I needed some time away from football. I just didn't think it would be forever. At the end of the day, I know I gotta own my part. Was I perfect as a player, as a person? Hell no. I shouldn't have been sipping like that in the NFL. I should have stayed in better shape. I should have been more of a student of the game. I got to live with my mistakes. I'd do it 10 times differently today if I was coming up in a different era. But when these media guys are always asking me, what do you regret? That's how I know they ain't never been in my neighborhood. Everything I did and how I did it, it got me to the NFL. I'm me, bro. I can't be nobody else for you. Ask my grandma. She'll tell you. I never had no filter ever since I was a little ass kid. Four years old, she took me over to her neighbor's house for Christmas. And I took one look at the sad little tree they had in the living room. And I said, what you doing with that Charlie Brown tree up in here? <laughs> Neighbor lady was about to whip my ass. I could just never fake it. It was never an option. I wouldn't have made it past 14. I wouldn't have got up off the grass the first time blunt high starfished my ass. They'd have chewed me up if I was any different. I was with the wolves, bruh. But when I got into the NFL environment, they didn't want to accept somebody like me at the quarterback position. They took one look at me and they didn't see the face of the franchise. They saw all the jewelry, the way I talked, the way I dressed, my grandma, and they only saw one thing. To them, I was always just a nigger. But if I have one legacy, let it be that I refuse to bow down to any man who treated me like I was beneath them, no matter who they were. Some things are bigger than football. Whenever I hear somebody say my name now, my full name, I pretend I'm not him. Are you Jamarcus Russell? They say it like it's one word. Jamarcus Russell, Jamarcus Russell, Jamarcus Russell. Hey, yo, man, are you Jamarcus Russell? I always say, nah, bro, I'm Trinnell. I get that all the time. Dude must look like me for real, though. And then I just keep it moving. I know when I hear, Jamarcus Russell, you don't really know me. If you rock with me, then you know me as Scooter or Lil Lloyd or J-Rock or Xena's son or a bunch of other names. I could never even fathom being a famous person. I don't like cameras. I don't do this shit. And maybe that's why I feel so misunderstood. The only thing I ever wanted to do was throw the football and get that paper for my family. In the years after I was released, I kind of lost myself for a minute. I ended up coming back home and I started coaching up the kids at the same parks I used to play at back in the day. And that's what made me find my love for the game again. It's funny, man. These kids, you know, the number one question they ask me, they just want to know, how do I get some money? Period. They're just trying to get that paper. They want to provide. They want better for their family. Everything I ever did and me telling this story, Hopefully it's like a blueprint for them, the good and the bad. They don't look at me like a bust. They look at me like a miracle. I went to LSU. I went number one. 
I got paper. I had coaches coming down here, eating my grandma's cooking. I changed my family circumstances forever. Everything else is gravy, for real. Yeah, I only played for three years in the league, but those three years cover a lifetime. Man, you know what I think about all the time? I was out in Vegas one off season, and I'm at the craps table shooting some dice, and the biggest goddamn security guard I've ever seen in my life comes walking through, looking like he's protecting Obama or some shit. Nah, it's bigger than the president. It's Beyonce and Jay-Z. I'm looking like, damn. Normally, I'm not a starstruck person, but shit, it's Jigga. All of a sudden, Jay recognizes me as he's walking past, and he takes the time to say what's up to me. B kept it moving. <laughs> she kept it pushing, man. But Jay came over and acknowledged me. After he left, I remember just sitting there shooting dice, and it really hit me like, damn, that nigga Jigga really knows me. He knows the kid from Mobile. You know what I'm saying? You can say whatever the hell you want about Jamarcus Russell, Jamarcus Russell, Jamarcus Russell. Maybe you look at me and you see a failure. That's cool. I see something a hell of a lot different. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. My daddy was a project nigga. My mama worked at the shipyard. She worked every kind of job. All around us, nothing but poverty. I wasn't supposed to be shit, man. I wasn't even supposed to be here. I'm talking here, here. I shattered every expectation for my life. I was Mr. Football for the whole state of Alabama. I brought Nick Saban to the neighborhood. I got millions to wear some Nike shoes and to play the game I love. I was the second black quarterback to go number one after Mike Vick. I ain't no failure. I'm a king. I'm still Jamarcus Russell. And this is MC's Voice, narrating this article in theplayerstribune.com, written by Jamarcus Russell, entitled, Y'all Don't Know a Damn Thing About Jamarcus Russell. 